Well, welcome everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people here. Uh, I'm really, really thrilled. Thank you very, very much for coming to support, to support this. Um, some of you may be thinking, uh, haven't we been here before? Um, di didn't we have a centenary celebration in um, 2008? Um, well, yes, we did. Um, but that was a different one. Um, that, that was uh, the start of drama in Hampstead Garden suburb. And what we're celebrating today is uh, the centenary of the Play and Pageant Union, uh, which is the actual uh, society of which GST is a uh, continuation. So it is the 100th birthday of GST. Um, now, inevitably, uh, I'm going to say a few things that some of you may have heard before, um, so I apologise for that, uh, but I think it's always worth hearing again and good to do a little revision. Um, so, um, I'm actually going to begin uh, not in Hampstead Garden suburb, uh, but in Whitechapel. Um, can everyone see? Um, this is um, a, uh, a street uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, in the East End of London. Um, in 1873, uh, a young clergyman called Samuel Barnett uh, went with his wife, Henrietta, uh, to be vicar of St. Jude's Church in Whitechapel. It was regarded as the worst parish in the diocese. Just behind uh, St. Jude's Vicarage uh, ran Gunthorpe Street, uh, where Jack the Ripper found his first victim in 1889 and the housing conditions there were appalling. Henrietta Barnett wrote that the whole parish was covered with a network of courts and alleys. None of these courts had roads. In some, the houses, three stories high, were hardly six feet apart, the sanitary accommodation being pits in the cellars. In other courts, the houses were lower, wooden and dilapidated, a standpipe at the end providing the only water. Each chamber was the home of a family who sometimes owned their indescribable furniture, but in most cases the room were let, rooms were let furnished at eightpence a night. In many instances, broken windows had been repaired with paper and rags. The banisters had been used for firewood. Paper hung from the walls, which were the residence of countless vermin. Overcrowding in these conditions led to disease, and disease to high death rates, and as Henrietta said, where the death rate is high, um, the, uh, uh, there we find a lower vitality, a general disinclination to work. There we see the jaded, spiritless man and woman whose only pleasures often become those of alcohol and gambling. Hampstead Garden suburb <laughs> was to be the exact antidote to Whitechapel. In Henrietta Barnett's words, it was to be a community of all classes to provide a bridge <laughs> to provide a bridge between poverty and privilege and to overcome the ignorance that separated the two nations, rich and poor. And this is a portrait of Henrietta and Samuel Barnett uh, by Hubert von Herkimer, which hangs at Toynbee Hall in Whitechapel, uh, the settlement which they both founded. A community is not just about housing. A community requires facilities for recreation. And Henrietta Barnett, who had strong views about most things, uh, had strong views about recreation. She divided them into two categories those which breed idleness and those which call for effort. In the first category, she put seaside resorts, <laughs> ribald gaiety and inane beach shows, football matches, thousands watch, often ignorant of the science of the game, but captivated by the hope of winning a bet or the spectacle of brutal conflict. And slightly closer to home, music halls, the most insufferable banality and imbecility that ever fell upon human ears. <laughs> In 
into the second category, she put music, games of skill, books, athletics, foreign travel, walking tours, sailing, photography, picture galleries, botanical rambles, antiquarian researches, and others too numerous to mention. These were the recreations that called forth effort, and effort leads to progress. So how did drama rate on the Barnet scale of recreational values? Well, we've heard what she said about music hall. She was also unhappy about plays where the interest centers around the breaking of commandments and fools make a mock of sin. <laughs> Samuel, however, said, a good drama is recreation if the spectator is called to give himself to thought and feeling. The Barnetts wrote a book called Practicable Socialism, and Henrietta, uh, her, her article in it, uh, was subtitled Recreation and Character, which gives something of its flavour. Uh, Samuel quotes William Morris in his article on recreation, and uh, Morris, in a book on socialism that he'd written in 1893 called Socialism, Its Growth and Outcome, wrote about drama. It is, as to its execution, wholly a cooperative art, and its production does not require the same amount of training as any other of the arts, mm. and therefore could be more easily and pleasantly dealt with by a communal society working cooperatively. So here we have the two themes of effort and cooperation. Uh, one of the uh, curious phenomena of the early part of the 20th century uh, was the staging of very large-scale theatrical shows. Uh, these often has an implicit or sometimes explicit political aim. And, and this sort of thing led ultimately to the spectacular displays of power that we saw in the Nuremberg rallies and the Red Square parades. Um, in England, um, there was the indoor variety of the spectacular show, such as the play called The Miracle by Karl Vollmuller, which Max Reinhardt produced in 1911. Um, it was a sort of wordless play with a cast of thousands, but it was very popular at the time. And then outdoor pageants were also uh, extremely popular. Um, it's tempting to link the revival of pageants with the arts and crafts movement. Um, the arts and crafts movement believed in a return to the late Middle Ages when man led a contented life of harmonious work and play, uncorrupted by industrialization. Um, pageants in medieval times had been ceremonies or short dramatic scenes at fixed points uh, within a city wall, uh, illustrating a theme or a story, um, usually a religious one, often given to welcome an important visitor or personage. And certainly this idea seems to have occurred to Samuel Barnett because he wrote, England in her great days was merry England. Many of our forefathers' recreations were cruel and horribly brutal. They had, however, certain notable characteristics. They made greater demands on both body and mind. Their pageants and spectacles were not just shows to be lazily watched. They enlisted the interest and ingenuity of the spectators and stirred their minds to discover the meaning of some allegory or trace out some mystery. This idea of Merry England, the idyllic world of the medieval craftsmen, is a recurrent theme of the arts and crafts movement. And John Ruskin, regarded as its father, when he was 19, wrote nostalgically of the green and leafy vista found in its perfection only in England, associated with all that once contributed to give our land its ancient name of Merry England, a name which in this age of steam and iron, it will have some difficulty in keeping. But in fact, it was not Ruskin, or William Morris, or the arts and crafts movement, which influenced the revival of the pageant in the early 20th century. Um, it was a former music master at Sherborne School turned playwright with the somewhat improbable name of Louis Napoleon Parker. <laughs> um, he invented the idea of a pageant as a collection of spectacular historical episodes illustrating a given theme or tradition. 
and the first one was held at Sherbourne itself in 1905. Um, but the idea spread very quickly, and they were held at Warwick, Dover, York. Uh, the one at York, in fact, included an original pageant wagon from the uh, 16th century, um, Oxford, and others. Uh, the performers, who were usually amateurs, townspeople and schoolchildren, were usually directed by a professional who was responsible for the songs, dances, and short interludes of dialogue which made up the whole, including sometimes reenactments of medieval joustings and tournaments. The performances usually took place in a large park or in the countryside beyond the city boundaries, and props and costumes were usually made by the local population. Uh, Parker doesn't actually seem to have been influenced directly by a desire to recreate Ruskin's Merry England. Um, his ideas have more of the flavour of the utopian propaganda of the French revolutionary pageants. He wrote, a pageant is a festival of thanksgiving in which a great city or a little hamlet celebrates its glorious past, its prosperous present and its hopes and aspirations for the future. It's also a great festival of brotherhood in which all distinctions of whatever kind are sunk in a common effort. So here again, we have cooperation and effort. When the suburb was begun in 1907, it was surrounded by farmland and meadows. Um, this is a photograph actually taken by Henrietta Barnett herself. Um, the underground terminated at Golders Green. And this is the same photograph, um, which uh, actually shows Henrietta Barnett's handwriting um, underneath it. Um, and I will read you what she's, what she's written. <clears throat> Uh, this is the, one of the views to be seen uh, from the high land of the proposed garden suburb uh, overlooking the 80 acres of open space which became Hampstead Heath Extension. Um, the presentation of plays, as I mentioned at the start, started in 1908 with a group of about 20 people. Um, so we celebrated 100 years uh, in 2008. We know that they started in 2008 because of some records uh, written by a chap called Stephen Coffin. Uh, he came to the suburb uh, as a young man with his wife, um, and I was very privileged uh, to be introduced to him by Diana Bromley um, at the very first show that I took part in, in 1978, I think, when he was in his 90s. Um, <clears throat> uh, he tells us that there wasn't any record of what was performed in the first two years, uh, and the first production of what we, uh, what we, which we actually have got some records, um, is the first outdoor pageant, which was called The Mask of Fairthorpe. It was a pageant produced in September 1910. Um, this is a map which Stephen Coffin drew, um, showing uh, where the pageant ground was. It's a little difficult to see, but it is... Um, uh, that's the pageant ground, and it is roughly where we are now in the Free Church Hall. Um, so that's, that's Big Wood, and Big Wood was bigger then uh, than it is now, but the wood is behind us, um, and, and so this is in fact uh, roughly where what you're about to see took place. And uh, here is a view of uh, the audience uh, for the Mask of Fairthorpe. Um, uh, at, uh, at uh, that very first uh, pageant on the edge of the wood. Um, this is a list of the characters. Uh, those of you who are local will recognize some of the names. Asmund, Asmund's Hill, Will of the Field, Willowfield Way, the Nymph of Mead, Mead Way, the Templar, uh, Temple Fortune, and Jerry, the Builder. <laughs> And uh, then we have um, <clears throat> a, uh, a series of uh, other characters, including a devil, builders, craftsmen, uh, revelers, and so on. Um, this is the uh, first page of the script. As you can see, it's very beautifully illustrated. This is a, a copy of it. Um, <clears throat> the Mask of Fairthorpe, wherein is set forth by a merry device 
the birth and true intent of this fair village. So it's an allegory about the founding of Hampstead Garden Suburb three years earlier. C. The meadow behind the institute. The institute is what is now Henrietta Barnett School. Bugle calls are heard approaching. Asman appears from the corner of the wood on tiptoe. The nymph follows. They gaze timidly towards the sound. The nymph sheltering behind Asman. The bugle is heard again. Asman. There it is again. The nymph shrieks. Enter Will. Will, what's the matter? Asman. Destructions on our fields. And all our joyous woodland company, lovers of moonlight, treaders of grassy circles, are exiles. Rainbow wings must be unfurled and we must fly, a band of desolate sprites to other woods and kindlier habitations. Will, once more I ask you, what on earth's the matter? Asma. Gross monsters and grim spectres of the city are crawling ever out across the fields, devouring all the green trees, hedges, flowers, and leaving in their stead the horrid tracks of staring bricks and mortar. A cart appears. Jerry and Co. <laughs> Nymph. He comes. The slimy monster, winding serpent, oozing and spreading o'er the hapless fields, unchecked, untrammeled by the dread bylaws of our great district council. Uh, Templar. Villain! Stand! Jerry stands up. The cart stops. And Jerry says, I'm going to enterprise on these fields. Don't you interfere with enterprise. Individual enterprise is the mainstay of this great British empire. Oh dear. But then, a pantechnicon appears. And on it are the letters H-G-S-T, the Hampstead Garden Suburb Trust. They are saved. The van drives in, doors open, craftsmen appear. And they sing, sing the crafts to honor, shout for labor's dignity, praise the faith in striving, praise the joy of unity. <laughs> During the chorus, there's more, there's more, don't clap yet. Um, Yes, that's uh, probably um, uh, what I've just done. And then, um, during the chorus, gardeners appear. And the head gardener says, With spade and fork, with rake and hoe and dibble, we come all armed, a band of eager diggers with vaporite and other insect killers, with silver sand and scythes and superphosphates. We join the troop of energetic persons who shortly will inaugurate the suburb. A burst of singing is heard at the Institute, and revellers troop out, led by mirth and folly, and they sing, Here's good luck unto our enterprise, with a fa la 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 confusion to its enemies, with a fa la 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 and he that will our pleasure share, let him come breathe our country air. He'll find no better anywhere with a fa la 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 with a fa la 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 let flourish mirth and amity with a fa la 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 good health long life and jollity with a fa la 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 and who would see a picture fair should scan the view from central square he'll find no better anywhere with a fa la 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 with a fa la 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 Inhabitants with chairs, tables, tools, etc., rush across the square. First inhabitant. Are we in time? All. Yes! Sure, there's a plot left. Several. Come on! First inhabitant. But small ones. We don't want big houses. Yes, yes! Mirth. But where are your clothes? All. Why here? Mirth. But you can't possibly come like that. 
We don't look like that. First inhabitant. Do you mean to say we must dress up in that ridiculous style? Murph. Dress up? We are not dressed up. When you come here, you naturally lose your dullness and dreariness and dinginess. Your spirit changes colour and your clothes follow suit. As a matter of course. Second inhabitant. Look here. We've all been respectably brought up. Murph. Well, thank goodness that's over. Um, <clears throat> and um, then there's another song. When, <clears throat> when London suburbs first arrived on every vacant space, the jerry builder soon contrived a house to meet the case. He set it fifty in a row, its beauties were but few, and they were put in front to show in this jolly bad house and new. Back and sides go bare, go bare, inhabitants go mad, but in front was a dormant ample enough in this jolly new house and bad. But now the garden suburbs hear another tale we tell, another sort of house we rear, wherein a man may dwell. And all around a garden grows, and roses on the wall, wherein a man may stick his nose for a jolly good sniff and all. <laughs> Back and side and front as well are covered o'er with flowers, and merry's the life as you may tell in this jolly good house of ours. The master builder says, the architects, makers of regulations, governors of all the fortunes of our paradise, approach to add their number to the band. And the chief architect says, on this auspicious day, may each kind star shed favourable beams upon our band, and the spirit of beauty everywhere preside with girded loins, and mind and hearts attuned for bold endeavour. Let us dedicate our wisdom, toil and courage to a task glorious indeed. Initiators we, leaders and guides in high experiment before the eager eyes of multitudes wide with the prospect of unhoped release from sad captivity. Now, stifled townsmen, groping and gasping in their shapeless streets like spirits in a caverned labyrinth of formless, dull and enervating shade, shall seize a glimpse of this, our newer way. E'en as from dark emerging, one may catch a gleam of sky, a breath of vital air, and happy folk seen on a bright hillside. And Asmund, Nymph, Will, Templar, and the elves reappear, and the nymph says, Elves, in a circle, gather round, bid a blessing on the place, with every joy your toil be crowned, every hope and every grace. And um, <clears throat> uh, then uh, the... Um, uh, all step back during the final song, and Cleo appears, the muse of history, registering a great day in her scrub. Um, this was written by Paul Jewett, uh, who lived in Temple Fortune Lane and was an English master at William Ellis School. <laughs> uh, the Mask of Fairthorpe was followed in August 1911 uh, by the Empire Fair, Fair Pageant by Kate Murray. Uh, this included various scenes from English history and legend, such as the story of Robin Hood, and it was in aid of the St Jude's building fund. Um, <clears throat> Adam Bell, the 1912 pageant, was more ambitious. It was by Frank Stuart Murray and told the story of three outlaws, Adam Bell, Clem of the Clough and William of Cloudsley. It was revived in 1931 
uh, when Queen Elizabeth, uh, the Queen Mother, uh, who was then Duchess of York, visited the suburb and attended a performance. And some of you may have noticed there's actually a picture of that in the hut in the wood. Uh, the 1931 version uh, had an impressive set, including a medieval castle borrowed from Elstree Film Studios. Um, the 1913 pageant uh, was called The June Mask and was by Paul Jewett again, who'd written The Mask of Fairthorpe. Uh, the local paper, uh, the town crier, uh, noted that the characters included the sun and a barometer, some summer winds, several mushrooms, <laughs> and Flora marshalling her flowers. Most of these were played by children. Uh, girls played flowers and boys played mushrooms. <laughs> And uh, here we have um, Wilfred Meadows dressed as a mushroom. <laughs> um, by December 1913, there were three separate drama groups uh, in the suburb. Um, as well as the outdoor pageants, they put on indoor plays in the Institute. After the 1913 June mask, a competition was held uh, for the 1914 pageant and in January 1914, the winning entry was declared to be a mystery of the valorous knight St. George. Or to give it its full title, <clears throat> a mystery of the renowned and valorous knight St. George of England, showing of his parentage and strange taking away when a cradle child and famous slaying of the great dragon by Frank Stuart Murray and John Armitstead. Uh, the story of St. George and the Dragon is used uh, as a framework for scenes from medieval life uh, performed with great gusto by a cast of up to 300 performers. Um, <clears throat> here we see St. George on his horse. <coughs> he slides off the horse. Sword in hand, he goes into the wood. The dragon roars. Clouds of smoke waft from the wood. Eventually, St. George emerges from the wood, backing away from the monster. The monster rears up with loud cries, and in a final effort, he slays it and sinks to the ground, in, and he sinks to the ground in exhaustion. And the town crier thought that the dragon could have been more effective. <laughs> it could have had with advantage, they said, a little more decided suggestion of the traditional carnivorous maw with adequate dental equipment. <laughs> the tongue of flame, the blood red eye, and general scaliness. However, the editor wrote that had their critic been there at one of the subsequent performances, he could not have failed to be satisfied with the dragon. Those baleful fumes from the wood raised a magnificent sense of horror in the spectators. And Stephen Coffin tells us, I can't now remember all the mechanics of the dragon, but he was a good one. His head emerged from one part of the wood and his tail from another, <laughs> making him look very big. Um, finally, after a dance of strange small folk who come forth from the woods, um, <clears throat> um, the um, Lady Merwin um, is borne in on her litter, having been in a trance for 18 years, um, from which she is miraculously awakened and recognises St George as her lost son. Um, her procession um, include, uh, included uh, the Reverend Basil Borch Boucher, who was the first vicar of St Jude's, as Bishop Wolthoff. And according to the town crier, although having nothing to say, he contributed a gratifying dignity. <laughs> Uh, the entire production was a genuine community effort. Uh, the music was written by the organist of the Free Church. The dances were arranged by Mrs Forsyth, a local resident. Uh, the costumes uh, were designed and made in the suburb, and the crowd was a real crowd made up of mothers and children, uh, brothers and sisters, people of different social classes playing the communal role of a crowd in a medieval town. And this was the recreation that called forth effort and cooperation as Henrietta Barnett had put it, and the communal society working cooperatively, as William Morris had described it. A competition was held for the 1915 pageant, and it was judged by Harley Granville Barker. 
uh, Granville Barker lived from 1877 to 1946. And uh, as you may know, he was a famous actor, director, playwright, manager, and as we're told, critic and theorist. Um, in 1914, he had uh, directed a production of Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which was quite revolutionary because he removed all the conventional scenery, uh, replaced it with merely symbolic scenery, and uh, encouraged ensemble acting. Um, the competition was won by Cyril Kelsey and Percy Meadows uh, with, a, with a pageant called Pan Pipes in Arcos. Um, the Kelseys and the Jewets um, were both um, from families who were very active through several generations uh, in the suburb and in the uh, amateur dramatic activities. And um, when I uh, first joined uh, the society, um, I remember talking to one of the older members called Marjorie Scarf, and uh, her father knew the Kelseys, uh, and also had a rather good description of the early residents of the suburb, um, whom he described as uh, men uh, with long hair, beards, and sandals, and women um, who had short hair and wore pewter jewellery. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, before uh, any more could happen, uh, war intervened, and uh, so the, um, <coughs> uh, the pageant in 1915 wasn't held. Um, but uh, in April uh, 1914, uh, they held a, a meeting, the, the pageant committee, uh, to discuss a possible new location uh, for the pageant ground from here, where we were standing, to somewhere else. Uh, and it was suggested in May that year that maybe it could go into Bigwood behind us, um, but there were concerns that that might uh, cause damage to it by crowds. Um, despite the war, uh, there was some dramatic activity in the early days, uh, and Othello was apparently staged in December 1915 at the Institute. And there was a proposal to stage a pageant in 1916, uh, but it never came off. The pageant committee held sporadic meetings, but after the AGM in 1917, uh, it went into abeyance. However, in January 1919, it came out of hibernation, and Paul Jewett proposed the formation of a play and pageant union uh, to put amateur dramatic activities on the suburb onto a more definite footing, and as he later put it, because they wanted to do indoor as well as outdoor plays. Negotiations started up again for a new pageant ground, and this time Littlewood was chosen. Interestingly, uh, Cyril Kelsey was concerned about the noise of trams along Finchley Road. <laughs> this was, of course, before they built the A1. Um, the theatre was designed by Herbert Welch and Frank Hart, who were both architects operating in the suburb. Uh, the wood was actually owned by the church commissioners at this time, who'd owned it for many centuries, and it was only transferred to Finchley in 1933, and now, of course, belongs to Barnet. The AGM of the pageant committee on the 17th of January 1920, 100 years ago yesterday, uh, marked the demise of that organisation and the birth of the Play and Pageant Union, which has continued until this day. It continued on its own until 1966, and then it merged with one of the other drama groups in the suburb called the Speedwell Players uh, to become what was given a temporary name of the Hampstead Garden Suburb Dramatic Society. And the temporary name lasted from 1966 until 1992, <laughs> uh, when it became the Garden Suburb Theatre. Um, at that first meeting, a uh, hundred years and one day ago today, uh, there were um, 200 people present, only slightly more than we've got tonight, um, and they had 70 pounds, eight shillings in hand. Um, which, Alicia, I'm sure you would agree, was probably quite a good, <laughs> a good amount. So, uh, how did these activities measure up to Henrietta Barnett's rigorous standards for progressive recreation? Well, I think we can judge from her own words uh, when she was asked to accept the position of president of the Play and Pageant Union at that first meeting in January 1920. Uh, she accepted and was pleased to say that she had happy memories of the pageants and the beauty of it all in those lovely June days. She felt strongly that some of the noblest thoughts of the world had been given through the medium of plays, and now they were inaugurating a new society which would be the medium for conveying what was best in the lives of them all. She thought that all pleasure 
should unite people of all sorts of opinions and classes, and that the best pleasures had effort behind them. Effort behind play helped play to be joyful and certainly helped in the development of character. Um, at that very first meeting on the 17th of January, uh, 1920, they performed two plays. Um, the first was called The Constant Lover by St. John Hankin, and the second, uh, The Saint, by Paul Jewett, who had written The Mask of Fairthorpe. Uh, this is a picture of St. John Hankin. Um, he lived from 1869 to 1909. Uh, he was the drama critic for The Times and a playwright. Um, he admired Shaw, uh, and he sought to break from conventionalities of the day, like Shaw. Uh, the Constant Lover was written in 1908. Um, it's subtitled, A Comedy of Youth in One Act. And uh, it has a, a little sort of strap line where he writes, as of old, when the world's heart was lighter. But sadly, Hankin himself uh, suffered from increasingly severe mental ill health uh, and killed himself in 99, aged 39. So the constant lover was actually first performed after his death in 1912, only eight years before its performance by the Play and Pageant Union. Um, tonight, uh, the main characters are going to be played by uh, Finn Batchelor and Jesse Musker. And uh, Finn is the fourth generation of uh, people who've been involved in the society, and Jesse in the third generation. So we're continuing the tradition of families associated uh, with the society. Uh, the script of the saint um, seems to be lost. I've done quite a lot of research, uh, the London Metropolitan Archives and elsewhere, to try and find it. Um, but I do have a cast list. Uh, the Bishop was played by Philip Jewett, uh, probably Paul's brother. Mephistopheles by Cyril Kelsey. Um, the Deacon by James Anderson. Fra Giuseppe by Harold Jewett. And Three Devils, played by Paul Jewett, Enid Kelsey and J.F. Watson Hunt. Uh, the scene is set in a room in the bishop's palace in Florence in the 15th century. So we have a bishop, uh, Mephistopheles, three devils, set in a bishop's palace in the 15th century. So it sounds as though it had a similar flavor to a short story by Richard Garnet called The Demon Pope that we're going to perform for you tonight. Um, this was by Richard Garnet. Um, he lived from 1835 to 1906, and he had a distinguished career as a librarian and scholar. This was a spy cartoon, so he obviously got to the status of deserving a spy cartoon. Um, in 1890, he became keeper of a printed books at the British Museum, the equivalent of head of the British Library today. Uh, the Demon Pope uh, was a short story in a volume entitled The Twilight of Gods, which was published in 1888 and republished in 1903. Uh, and I've dramatised it for performance tonight, uh, so this is the premiere of the stage version. Um, in April 1920, uh, they performed a quadruple bill. Um, the first play was Columbine by Reginald Arkell, and we're told it was set in a Roman camp on the South Downs. Uh, the second play, Sister Helen by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Uh, the third play... <clears throat> Dead Heat, une comédie en un acte de Messieurs de Ferrodi et Gérouche. La scène se passe à Paris de nos jours. We're told it was rehearsed by Madame A. M. Gachet, so we must assume it was performed in French. They were very highbrow, this one. Uh, and the fourth play, I've heard of triple bills, but quadruple bills, honestly. Um, the fourth play was Dead Heat by Charles McAvoy, uh, which is set on a road 12 miles from Marlborough in the late afternoon of the present. And the next production was Pan Pipes in Arcos, uh, which we're going to perform for you tonight. Um, it was performed on the 19th and 26th of June at 3.30 and 6.30, and there was an additional benefit for the Hendon Cottage Hospital on the 14th of August. And it was the first production in the new theatre in Littlewood. It had a cast of 43 men, 60 women, and 95 children. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and it was attended by over 2,800 people. Um, they had problems not dissimilar to our own. Um, the first of these was the non-arrival of chairs. <laughs> the, the van broke down. They substituted a horse van, but the horse van went to the wrong address. <laughs> so the clubhouse and the school had to help out. Um, So, this is uh, Philip Jewett as Pan. Uh, the Gold of Green advertiser tells us, Pan was taken up by Mr. Philip Jewett, who has finally got up for the part and played it with a virility and agility. <laughs> Two small animals. The Morning Post tells us, Unrehearsed comic relief was afforded by a little Irish to his amazement at the white rabbit and other small animals personated by tiny children in wonderful makeup caused much derision. <laughs> I know it was a terrier and not a dachshund. Um, here we have uh, Philocrates and his court. Uh, Philocrates was played by George Bishop. He was the drama critic uh, and editor of the era. And um, he, uh, at various times, uh, was also a drama critic uh, for the Daily News and the Daily Telegraph. Um, uh, here's a, uh, another picture of them. Uh, the Daily News wrote, the costumes, which were quite a feature of the production, were copied by local artists from designs in the British Museum. Um, this is Daphnis and Irene, who were played by John Garside and Isabel Lohman. Uh, John Garside uh, was a distinguished professional actor and designer, and he appeared in many West End shows. Uh, he was born in Salford and went to the Manchester School of Art and the Slade School uh, before joining the Liverpool Rep in 1911 under Basil Dean. He made his first professional appearance in 1920, the same year that he appears on stage here. And uh, he was in the old Vic seasons between 1921 and 1928 as Launcelot Gobbo, uh, Polonius, uh, Quince, Andrew Eggcheek, uh, and others. Um, the advertiser uh, tells us that Mr. John Garside looked the fine part of Daphnis to the life and played it with a masterfulness and becoming modesty. Um, after the war, um, he played Chief Sitting Bull in Annie Get Your Gun at the Coliseum, beginning in 1947, for 1,300 performances without missing a single one. And he devoted an immense amount of time uh, to the Play and Pageant Union. He was chairman for 25 years, from 1928 to 1953. And he did a number of really wonderful sets, which justify a talk in themselves. Um, here we see a nice little backstage view. And here's another backstage view. And if this makes you thirsty, uh, there'll very shortly be an opportunity for refreshments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But I will take some questions if anyone would like to ask me any questions. Well, the Speedwell players uh, were set up by those who felt, I think, um, that they weren't being welcomed by the Play and Pageant Union. Uh, the Play and Pageant Union was seen as very highbrow, and uh, the Speedwell players um, wanted to be more sort of um, um, jolly and, uh, and, and inclusive. Um, their founder said, we would not go round handing out the frozen mitt. Um, um, and... Um, uh, some of you may remember, I did in fact do an extract from their first production, which was an extremely inconsequential comedy called The Charm School. Um, and um, they continued in that vein for some years with uh, the Play and Pageant Union doing rather sort of high-minded things. 
um, and, and the outdoor shows, and the Speedwells doing uh, rather lighter stuff. Uh, but by the mid-50s onwards, um, they were both doing a similar sort of repertory, and a lot of people belonged to both. So by the mid-60s, it made sense to merge them. Any other questions? Well, enjoy the refreshments.